Hello, Yiri. Hey, hey, Kyle. Hey, Mike. Hi, Yiri. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. So, are you an iOS developer? Yes, I am. Uh, I've been doing iOS apps since 2009, so it's like oh. <laughs> 12 <laughs> years. I even yeah. stopped counting the number of years, you know. <laughs> since time. the beginning. Yeah. So you've seen Objective C, yeah, MRC like transitions to storyboards, like manual reference counting, all of that. <laughs> you know, yeah, even like every couple of years, I was thinking to myself, like, yeah, I should start something new, some new program programming <laughs> language. And then Swift came out. I said, okay, yeah, let's do Swift. And then Swift UI came out and said, okay, another new stuff. So a place keeping me still busy. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's the master plan behind all those changes. Apple just keeps <laughs> us engaged by you know changing the things. And yeah. When you start yeah. getting bored, they they change everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. All right. How can we help you today? Okay. Um, yeah. So recently, I've joined a new company, and uh, and on day one, I realized that's not uh, quite what I've expected. So. Uh, for example, you know, they use zero unit tests and they they have a modular architecture, but you know the modules modules are linking to each other, so it's like everything linked together. And yeah, um, and a lot of yeah, you know, other like smaller smaller things maybe, but yeah, in, immediately I saw like five six things which I believe are not done well. So, and I'm thinking how to handle this, how to handle this, how to, you know, give my advices to the team because I joined them as a regular developer and I have a feeling that I'm like from day one, I started telling them, yeah, okay, this is wrong. This should be done this way instead. So, but I don't want to look like, you know, some, selfish guy who's just telling them they are doing everything wrong so you know, if right. you have some advice for, for this yeah. so the first thing i'd like to see in teams like this is are they feeling the pain or the the problems they have <laughs> do they understand that they have a problem or they are happy with how things are yeah well you know they are busy so the typical argument we don't have time to write tests or another argument was like, uh, you know, regressions in the regressions, there are not many bugs which could be fixed by unit tests. So there is not, you know, the point writing unit tests. Actually, they are starting to write some UI tests first because, you know, actually the testing in the company is done in the way that they are having like release cycles every month. So, and before the release, uh, there are like three testers manually tapping the devices and trying, you know, manually testing the app. And it takes like, you know, two weeks for three people to test all the app. And if there is a bug, it needs to go back to the process of developing and go back to QA, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. And so it's a lot of time on the manual testing and the app is now being, you know, used to uh, multiple countries. So there are like currently four versions of the app. So, you know, it multiplies the, the testing they have to do. Yeah. So they are kind of realizing that this is not very, you know, scalable way of doing this. So they are writing UI tests as first to make the testers like less busy, but yeah. Um, yeah. Generally, developers tell me they would like to do unit tests, but they are busy with writing features, so there is no time left to write unit tests. So. Okay, but at least there is interest, right? Yeah, yeah. I like there is. Uh... Okay, and I already felt the pain of manual testing, and you multiply the number of. Uh, applications you're deploying, then you multiply the number of tests as well, and it can get out of hand. So they already understand that they need to automate this. They need some kind of automation, and they chose first UI tests. 
And eventually they will realize that this doesn't scale as well. And they will have like very slow UI tests, right? So the second thing I would check is how long have you been in this team? Yeah, it's been like two months, most, almost. Uh... Yeah, the first thing you need to build there is actually nurture a relationship with them first before trying to change everything. Otherwise, like, who is this new guy here telling us <laughs> what to do? Yeah. He doesn't understand. We need to move fast. We need to move fast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So nurture a relationship with the team first, you know, maybe you see some things wrong, but like, let it pass. But, you know, little by little, you show them different solutions to the problem. For example, you can write unit tests and deliver your feature on time. And you show them that it is possible. You see, I wrote unit tests and I deliver on time. Would they prevent you from doing that? Would they prevent you from writing the test? Because I know some teams that they will say, don't write to use. If you write unit tests, you're not going to merge your code. <laughs> Very dogmatic, absolutely. <laughs> But since you say they would like to, maybe you can show them the way, but not by pointing out what they're doing wrong, but actually doing your work right and showing them, hey, I wrote some tests here. If you're interested, I can show you how I did it. We could pair. Usually it's, it's like maybe one or two people are going to be amazed by, you know, a result like that. And gradually you start creating a following, you know, <laughs> converting you focus one on by one. <laughs> that Mike said that they are interested. Because I don't know how many people are working there, but if one is interested in the testing you're doing and he is amazed, like, oh my God, that's amazing. That's really cool how you wrote this test. Then you start nurturing this guy. Now it's two. And then another one is going to maybe join and say, hey, I'm interested in what you guys are doing here. And now it's three. And suddenly, one by one, you will get influence in the team. Because right now you're just yeah, one. I see. Uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe like, yeah, maybe I would like to do everything immediately, but it's there. Yeah, then I would like, I would, I would look like, yeah, I'm telling them everything's wrong. So I have to take it more slowly and do gradually. Yeah. Because otherwise there's going to be conflict, right? Like you believe in something that someone else doesn't. So <laughs> that's not going to happen. right? <laughs> yeah. So patience. it's going to make it. Yeah. Patience. And exactly. It's going to make the your day to day easier as well. If, if you find someone that they believe, you know, in the same principles or values that you have for writing software, absolutely. That which that's important, you know, for you. And especially if you keep delivering value for the company, right? Like, but otherwise there'll be conflict all the time, Yeah, <laughs> you know, and then this is going to play like maybe if you trying to solve the problem with conflict, what's going to happen is that then they'll be so much more defensive, it will be much harder to see change in the culture of the team, right? So that's why it's important to nurture relationships first and start showing with your own work instead of saying, oh, what you did is wrong and I'm going to refactor your code. No, when you have to implement some feature, you bring some tests and say, hey, I also wrote this test and it didn't take me longer. Now, this is a skill. If, and then if they're interested, then they will ask you, oh, how did you do it? Can you present a talk? Or if they're not being proactive, asking for it, then you offer and say, yeah, I've been writing some tests and I think the, the results have been positive. Like I could present a talk about it. If you guys are interested, I can show you how I did it. Yeah. And then little by little, the ones that are interested, you focus on the ones that are interested. The ones that are amazed by the new changes, like, oh, I want to learn this. Then you focus on them. And then you start multiplying the the people that will give you the influence there to to make change otherwise there'll be conflict you know and conflict is not bad there is no problem having conflict when there is trust when you build a relationship first because then it's a conflict but you know that everyone is on the same page you know that everyone is trying to achieve the same goal and then you can have conflict when there's trust so before trying to change everything nurture good relationship with everyone in the team and focus on the ones that are more interested in this new practices you're bringing 
teach them and they will help you influence the team little by little. And another thing you mentioned is that you joined as a regular developer, correct? Yes. But maybe it's time for you to become a lead developer and build your own team. And, you know, it's easier than joining a team and trying to change things from the bottom up. No, you join from a leadership position and you have much more influence in the decisions. Yeah, it's, but it's harder, you know, to get the leadership position. <laughs> yeah, but you should aim for it. Yeah. You should be looking for it, right? Definitely so, have the years of experience for them. Because you already have skills that they need, but they are not ready there. So you already, you, you already could be a lead in that team, right? And bringing those skills for them and helping them improve. So I think it's time for you to be ambitious there and become more of a lead. Okay. Yeah. Have you read the book? The lead developer essentials? Um, not yet. Not yet. Yeah, so get out for sure. Get out. For sure. It's going to help you out. <laughs> yeah, another another thing I, I wanted to say before is obviously from the reflection point of view now, you know, like going back, you said like you expected something else and something else happened when you joined this team. Just understand why this happened, you know, like what, what, what could you have done differently, you know, perhaps in the interview stages, you know, when maybe, maybe you didn't pair, you know, with someone there in the team to see their day to day operations, you know, and maybe that's a deal breaker for you, you know, like if you don't, uh, if you don't work with the, I don't know, like good practices and tests and all that, you know, maybe, you know, you, you need to find something else, but just, you know, think about it perhaps for the next time. Yeah, I was thinking like, yeah, I, I guess like in the next interview, I will be just interviewing them as well. You know, I will Absolutely. just ask yeah. if I can talk to some of their lead developer and I will ask my questions as well yeah. and try to try to avoid to getting to some place where I don't want to be. Yeah. Absolutely. The interview goes both ways. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we go deep into that in the book, by the way like how to perceive things and how to see them. Yeah. In this, on this topic. Yeah. Sorry, Kaya. Yeah. So the interview, you are interviewing them. They are interviewing you. And even if they give you an offer, you could say, Hey, before I accept this offer, could I talk to the team or maybe work a day with the team just to, to know how it is. Some companies would say, yes, you know, you could yeah. have a day in the life there <laughs> before you Absol actually absolutely. sign it up. Maybe they're going to say no, but maybe you can actually have lunch with the team. So can we have lunch with the team or meet the, my manager? It's much easier when you have a, an offer you know, in hand already because they already committed. They already committed to hiring you. And then you say, can we have lunch with the team? And then you ask some questions to them like, oh, how is the day to day? Like, how you guys approach the development process? How important is the uh, the testing strategies, what are you guys doing? And then you would find out, oh, no, we, 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 we would like to write tests, but we don't have time. Uh, we're starting to write UI tests, but we have three QA guys that will be checking out the code before. And then you, you already say, oh, maybe that's not the team I want to work in. Unless they're saying no. And then we are hiring you because we want you to come here and tell us what to do, like Absolutely. help us improve. But look how different the expectation now would be, right? If that's the case, you know. But I joined teams that were like with a terrible, messy legacy code base and little by little we improved it. So I don't think if you like the team and you like the company, it can be fixed. You just need a little bit of patience. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, I, I decided. Yeah, first I thought like that I want to join some team where I still can grow and learn from them. But this seems to me like more like I will grow and learn by trying to, you know, advise some you know, better approaches and stuff. So I uh, still can grow and learn, but in different ways. But yeah, still, I think it's very valuable to be there. 
Awesome. If you find it valuable to be there. Yeah, that's that's good. Make tiny, you know, build relationships and yeah. help them improve little by little. Awesome. Do you have any other questions? Yeah, I had uh, another question. Uh, so um, maybe so if we have the code base, which is not tested and not very well testable, how to how to approach it practically? Like, for example, you have some kind of class, let's say view model, and you want to write unit tests for it. And the view model, you know, it as its dependency, it has some protocol which has you know 50 methods in it and another dependency is a class some concrete class and so you know stuff which you are really not able to mock in tests and so how to approach testing the code like this well you need to find first of all the the points they're preventing you from test things usually are like single tones talking directly to network uh, components that then you cannot mock it. We need to actually make the network request, for example, and follow like a pretty much a refactoring step, like oh, accessing a dependency directly through a shared instance. Oh, let me move to constructor injection, for example, use dependency injection to enable uh, you to inject a different component there, right? Yeah. So there are steps depending on the problem you are trying to, to solve. But do you have an example of like something that? Um, yeah, well, we we use dependent injection. So everything is injected basically in the, in the constructor, but the dependencies are like what I've described. There is like protocol, which has actually kind of something like 80 methods. Wow. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's, you know, it's called API client and it, you know, every method is like one API call. So, and this protocol is injected to view models or to some, you know, these classes and they talk to this protocol. So it's dependent injection, you know, encapsulated in protocols, but it's still not very well testable. So how to, you know, I'm trying to, because you know the view model or other class which depends on this protocol, it usually uses like one method from this protocol. Yeah. So I try to extract only this one method into separate protocol and then wrap the huge protocol into the small protocol using mm -hmm. some adapters like this. So that's it. So if you have a protocol like massive <laughs> protocol with hundreds of methods. And you have a view model, for example, that uses one, only one of those methods, right? If you want to mock this protocol here, you need to implement all the methods. <laughs> so yeah. what do you do? You create a, another protocol, a small protocol with one method. And maybe you make this massive bit implemented, small, for example. So when you're testing, you just need to implement one method. And you inject this here, for example. Yeah, but then you have to still maintain, you know, backward compatibility because somewhere in the code base, the view model is initiated by passing the massive. Yeah, but this will maintain yeah. the uh, yeah. backward compatibility, right? And now say, no, I have two protocols and that's not great. But sometimes you need to make some decisions to make the code easier to test. They will, it will look like the code is worse, but it's a one step. If you start following this step all the time, at some point you will see that there is no need for a massive protocol anymore. And when this happens, you delete it, and then boom, it, the whole the, the code is the design is better now, right? So don't be afraid of making some decisions that may look like weird, but if it's solving a specific problem, that's fantastic. You know, if you read the working effectively with legacy code, they, they show you many techniques to deal with this kind of problems. For example, sometimes you have like a class, it's like a networking class, and it has a shared instance, static, at shared. 
everyone in the code that uses this shared instance is not even using dependency injection you know it's like oh how can i test this because down the view hierarchy very down the chain this is accessed directly i cannot use dependency injection there it's just impossible the way the code base is set up right now one thing you can do is to make this variable <laughs> a variable just so you can in tests you can still inject the global you can replace the global with a subclass for example and now you can test that without making network connections and you can say that wow but now it's worse because you can replace this at runtime and you can say yeah but this was one step i took until i can inject this dependency correctly to enable testability right and then you can even check like oh if debug <laughs> else you make this a let just to make sure that you don't replace it if you're running the production code for example but no that like there are techniques to start enabling testability in existing code that sometimes will look like it making the code worse but it's a step it's a refactoring step to enable testability and in the future you would follow the steps until you don't need global anymore i recommend you read the working effectively with legacy code book you learn a bunch of techniques but what you're doing is correct if you see a protocol with too many things and it's impossible to implement all of them or just too cumbersome too time consuming split it into a new one only with the methods you need this is, this is a prime example of why we say you, you need to follow you know good practices in unison you know it's like because yeah. You can use protocols and abstractions and dependency injection, but you know, like if you don't use other principles like the interface aggregation principle, boom, that's it. You know, it's done. Like it's even worse, maybe, you know. Yeah. So absolutely. Okay, cool. Yeah. Maybe I had another question, which is um um, yeah, so when I'm, you know, rewriting some of the parts of the app, I'm trying to make it ready for the future. The iOS app is currently uh, supporting iOS 12, uh, but yeah, I want to make it ready like for the Swift UI. So I'm like when I'm designing the APIs, uh, the interfaces of the classes and stuff, I'm kind of thinking how would I use it if I would be having Swift UI, or right now they appear like async await, you know, features. So the, the question is, if should I be thinking about those things, which maybe you know we might use them like one or two years from now, or may, we might not use them at all. So should should we prepare our interfaces like for this right now, or should we just do it the easiest possible way and not think about well, Swift UI or async await or things like this? This will depend on the the lifetime of the application, right? How long you think the application will exist for and will be maintained. But what I recommend you is not even to try to create interfaces that will be future ready about Swift UI and async await, but to follow design principles. Design principles. If you follow like the solid principles, for example, you will come up with code that is already future ready. Why? Because the principles or clean architecture or domain driven design or dependency injection, what do they tell you? To decouple logic from implementation details, higher level modules from lower level details. Now, async await, Swift UI, UI kit, those are lower level details. Right. And if you decouple your logic from those details, it's much easier to adopt new frameworks as they arrive. So if you follow those principles, you follow solid, you follow domain-driven design, dependency injection uh, patterns, your code will be more future-ready. Right? For example, uh, if you're using Combine, for example. But if you're using Combine everywhere, it will be hard to migrate to async await because you need to change everything. 
But if you say, no, I'm going to use combine only in the composition layer, then when you want to use async await, you just change the composition layer. You don't need to change the, the business logic. But if you are exposing publishers and things like that, like Rx Swift or Combine into your higher level modules, then it's going to be much harder to adopt new technologies in the future. So following good design principles and practices will help you create more future ready code. Okay, yeah, this is a good point, actually. Yeah, we are using Rx Swift, and well, I believe that the you know power of the reactive programming is that everything is a stream. So, of like you know, UI kit bindings that you have like the button dot rx dot, and you get the event. But then, yeah, so in like the view model, instead of calling a method, you would be passing a observable on the event but then this code is not very ready for swift ui so that's what i was kind of thinking that i will not put everything everywhere stream are like rx streams so yeah the, the good good way of thinking that we might use it only in some layer of the app but not everywhere even though we kind of lose the power of the framework but probably we are like more flexible for the future. Yeah, I think you can still maintain the power of the framework by using it only more close to the infrastructure rather than everywhere. Because if you think about it, if you define your business logic without streams, without asynchrony, without threading, without all this complexity, your higher level modules, your policies, your use cases, your domain models will be so much simpler. You'll just be pure functions, you know, like input, output with no extra layer of complexity. It's easier to develop it. It's easier to maintain it. It's easier to read it. You know, and it's easier to adopt new technologies as well because you change just the infrastructure, not the higher level modules. We showed this in the program when we introduce combine without changing any other code. Okay, so you For mean example. like in the business layer, we could, instead of having like publishers, we can have just like completion closures, something like this. Could be. Yeah. Or if you watch the, the live sessions, we show how to eliminate asynchrony yeah. from the Altogether. business logic layer, from the high level modules, because then everything looks synchronous as a business logic, right? Everything is synchronous in the business logic and you inject the asynchrony in the composition, in the infrastructure. Okay, I need to watch this session. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, because then it's much easier because now we'll add a lecture about us async await in the program. And I'm just gonna change the, the, the infrastructure and that's it. Nothing else will change, it will be very simple to adapt. Just like we we have a series on YouTube, the the quiz app series, where we built a quiz app in 2017 before the Swift UI existed, and then we decouple the UI, we decouple the, the higher level modules, the policies, the game logic from UI, from UI kit. And then we had one episode where we introduced Swift UI and we just wrote the Swift UI views composed with the same logic. So it was very easy for us to adopt this new framework that we didn't even know existed before, just because we follow design principles to decouple the high level modules from the UI infrastructure. So if you follow the design principles, you will be more future ready, not a hundred percent. It's impossible because you never know what's going to happen tomorrow, <laughs> but they will guide you to create better separation of concerns and more composable types without coupling. The problem here is coupling. If you couple your code with Rx Swift or with Combine, then every time you, you want to change it, you have to change everything because you couple your code with it. It prevents change. So if you want to be future ready, that's, that's one way to go. Follow the design principles and low coupling with those infrastructure frameworks. Think about UI as infrastructure. Think about asynchrony as infrastructure. Think about like network connections as infrastructure. And try to design your domain, your high-level modules 
decouple from all this infrastructure, just pure functions. Databases, like it is all in the infrastructure. Yeah, I was considering the, like the Rx, Swift, or combine maybe like a part of the infrastructure as well, but maybe that maybe it was wrong. Yeah, but if you expose them in the high level interfaces, for example, then you kind of have Rx Swift everywhere. And it works, you know, if, if you say no, no, you know what? It was an informed decision. We sit with the team and we say, we're going to use Rx Swift and we're going to use it forever. And we made this decision and that's it. Then it's fine, you know, because you are coupling, like it's like it, you're marrying the framework and that's fine. And say, and this is forever and that's fine. But if you want to say, no, we are testing our Rx Swift, but we don't know if we want to keep it, maybe we want to sync await in the future, then you start, you start separating it and moving it somewhere else. And then you're not coupled with it. Yeah, plus there are risks, like if, you, if you're using an you know, external dependency everywhere. You know. As Kyra said, you're coupled with it everywhere. So. Yeah, yeah. It's like imagine a scenario where for some reason arc swift mint then stops you know like you're gonna have to pick that up most probably fork the repository and have to maintain it yourself going forward for new ios versions and so on it's not going to be fun and a lot of people think kaya this is unrealistic well reactive coco is gone well still exists but much less maintained than arc swift Reskit, who is using Reskit? Still exists, but it's like libraries that were super popular like five or 10 years ago. And people say they're never going anywhere. They're gone. AF HTTP request was popular. You probably remember this one from the old days. Yeah. Do you remember 320? Which one? Which one? 320. Mostly. 320. No. Yeah. Yeah. 20, oh, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was like very old and very popular from the guy who then later like worked for Facebook and Ours. I I had my app like bound to it as well and then yeah they they announced they will stop you know supporting it and it was so so complex and so it created like a whole new environment for creating UI creating you know data sources and stuff so it was not possible to like get rid of it we have to just throw everything away and start work yeah. from scratch yeah. absolutely what killed reskit is because reskit was coupled with alamo fire 1.0 before url session existed and then apple introduced url session to replace ns url connection and everyone was like oh let's use it but reskit was so coupled with the old Alamo Fire 1.0 and Alamo Fire 1.0 couldn't use URL session. So they created Alamo Fire 2.0. <laughs> yeah. AF networking 2.0. And what happened is that they never had the time to migrate to 2.0 because all the APIs changed, everything changed and it would break everyone's code. So they just say, you know what? Forget it. <laughs> yeah. And the framework died and there was a bunch of code bases probably still use it and have to maintain it on their own. So parse as well. So it's it's easy for us to think that this framework exists and it's never going to go anywhere and boom, gone, <laughs> suddenly. <laughs> Async display kit, remember, for UI to replace UI kit. Render your UI in a background thread to performance improvements, for performance improvements. <laughs> But from the from the developer point of view, you know, like this is not that of a threat, you know. But for the business point of view, that's like critical. And it, like as the, as you progress, you know, in your career, you know, and becoming more senior and leading teams, like this is something to think about. You know, this is something to take it seriously. So if you couple all your code with one of those frameworks, like Rx Swift or something like this, you need to say. If they stop maintaining it, I'm going to maintain it. Like, and I have the resources to do that. So I'm happy. 
doing that. And then as a team decision, say, are we all happy? Yes, we are happy. Let's couple it. Yeah, fantastic. But it needs to be an informed decision, right? Yeah. Because there is risk. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. Does he answer your question? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It answered my questions. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Good so questions. Much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. And have you finished the program? Sorry? Have you finished the program? Uh, no, no. All right. You see all of these there. Yeah. Okay. We'll yeah. cover all of that in the lectures. Good. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.